All right, so it's been a few weeks since the last update, but as you can tell from the title, we now have online matchmaking. Right off the bat, I do want to apologize for how long it took to get this up and running, but I can't do this full time just yet. Your boy got to heat the lights on, right? But I do appreciate y'all for sticking around while I get things added. That said, getting online matchmaking set up was a labor of love, to be honest, but I'm excited to share the process with you. Let's get to it. As you know by now, I'm working on sticking to a proper process when going into project. You know, just trying to do things professionally and all that, which means more f***ing documentation. Anyway, the first thing I had to figure out was how exactly did I want to implement this? One thing I knew for sure was that I wanted to keep the original code of the game as unmodified as possible, which meant that the net code portion of the game would act as a sort of wrapper that would interact with the pre-existing code without needing to completely deconstruct everything that's already been put in place. The next thing to figure out was the menu flow. Since I wanted to keep the online and offline code from mingling more than it needed to, I decided that all of the matchmaking menu items would be placed on a separate scene. Now for those of you who haven't used Unity before, a scene is essentially just a separate level. From there, I needed to figure out the game flow of online matchmaking. And with this came a lot of questions that I would need to answer before even getting into the code. We'll get to those later. Finally, I updated the game design document, sketched some flow charts, and created a to-do list. Once all that was done, I was ready to get started. Let's start with the first question. How do games connect online? You can essentially break this down into two categories, dedicated servers and peer-to-peer -peer connections. For both of these examples, we're going to use three terms. Server, it's, well, the server. When players connect to an online match, they connect to the server. Host, this is the machine that owns the server and client. This is the machine that connects to the server. In a peer-to-peer -peer setup, any client can be the host or server. So in the case of this game, the server-side code will be ran on the hosting client's machine. Other players would then connect to the host's machine. If the host leaves, the server goes with them, and all connected players are kicked, unless you set up host migration. If the host leaves, one of the connected clients is chosen to be the new host, and all other clients connect through them. Another thing to note here is in this system, if the host has a potato internet connection, it's going to affect all connected clients, meaning everyone's going to be laggy. As you can tell, this is already getting complicated, and I've only attempted netcode once, six years ago. So I decided to go with a dedicated server instead. Now for a dedicated server. With this setup, the server is hosted on one or multiple machines, if you got that kind of bread, that are separated from the players, meaning none of the clients will be running server-side code. It's pretty much in the name. It's a machine that's dedicated to being the server and only the server. When connecting to a match, clients connect to the server, not to each other. The server handles network communication between each player. The more complex the game, the more data that needs to be sent back and forth. There's definitely more to it, but I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of how they work. Once I decided on how I wanted players to connect, the next thing to decide on was which networking solution would I use. I looked into a few of them, including Photon, Mirror, Fish Networking, and Unity's own networking system. One of the driving factors here was price, and I also needed a system that supported easily creating lobbies. The other driving factors were user reviews and how quickly could I get these set up. After looking around for a bit, Fish Networking stood out to me, primarily because of price and user friendliness. So that's what I went with. Fishnet also came with an example lobby scene that already handled hosting and joining games, although not quite exactly the way I needed it to. With that said, I would like to eventually learn Unity's new networking system. During research, it seemed pretty interesting. So after deciding on a solution, I planned out how I wanted to start implementing. First, I needed to get the lobby set up and get two clients connecting to each other in the lobby. I'll be using the example scene that came with Fishnet as a starting point. From there, I needed to customize the UI in the lobby to match the aesthetic of the game. Following that, the next thing to do is to have the lobby send both players into the game scene once they both join a room and ready up. Finally, once in the game scene, I then need to handle a few questions. Who goes first? How are turns synced? How does the camera work? How are moves synced between the players? What happens after a match? What happens if a player leaves during a match? What happens if a player disconnects before a match starts? Will there be a match timer? How are stalemates decided? With this list done, I started putting things together. 
It was really fortunate that Fishnet came with an example lobby scene because it gave me a solid starting point. I scanned through the documentation, looked at the code, played around with the UI a bit, and tested it a few times to learn how it worked. Once I figured it out a bit, I found that there were a few things I needed to change and some limitations that, while not being difficult to tweak, I decided to leave as is. The first of these was logging in. By default, each time a player connects to the server, they have to enter a username. These usernames are not permanent, and every time a player connects to the server, Server, they must enter the username again. If that name is currently in use by someone that's currently connected to the server, then that name cannot be used and you have to use something else. Permanent login and stat tracking data could be stored on the server, but it's outside the scope of this update. I may come back to it later, but I'll speak more on that at the end of the video. Next was how the example handled creating rooms. By default, it allowed more than two players to join a room and also allowed the host to start a match alone. I changed it to only allow two players in a room and set it so that if a room only has one player, that match cannot be started. The example already had UI to hold a list of existing rooms and a feature to host private rooms requiring a password. There are also these two buttons in the top left that are used to host the server as a client and to connect to the server as a client. These were useful when testing as they allowed me to host a local server on my own computer, but eventually I need to remove these. In the bottom right, there's a panel that shows room info and in the top right there's a button to leave the room. I eventually removed both of these. After tweaking the code to handle room creation and starting a match the way I want it, I gave it a quick test to see if players would be sent into the game scene, which they did, but since none of the gameplay code had been updated yet, it was essentially just two connected players playing against themselves. We'll get back to that after updating the lobby UI, because I wanted to make sure that the lobby was done before moving forward, one thing at a time. This was pretty straightforward and I'm happy with the result. The last thing to do was to go back to the main menu and update the UI to allow the player to reach the lobby scene. With the lobby scene done, I moved on to setting up the game scene and to start answering those logic questions I mentioned earlier. First of which is, who goes first? In regular chess, white pieces move first, but in this version, for online matches at least, it's decided by a coin flip. Whoever goes first has black, and their opponent gets white. Also, the winner of the coin flip gets to decide if they want to go first or second, and the result of the coin flip is handled by the server. The next question is, how are turns synced? This is where things start to get a little tricky because remember, I wanted to keep the existing code as unmodified as possible and have the net code act as a wrapper around that code. Before the coin flip, players have to wait until their opponents have fully loaded the game scene on their computer. This ensures that both players start the actual match together. From there, I moved on to the pieces. One option here was to have all the game's pieces have their transform data communicated back and forth to the server. This brings up an issue, bandwidth. When hosting a dedicated server, companies typically charge based on how much data is being sent and received from the server. I needed to minimize this in order to keep bandwidth costs down. So pieces aren't spawned by the server. Instead, they're only spawned locally for each player. The server does, however, keep track of what pieces are where on the board. I'm able to take this route because the pieces always spawn in the exact same positions every time a game starts. The next question, how are moves synced between players? When a player makes a move, that information is passed to the server and then from the server to the other player. Fortunately, I didn't have to modify the existing code too much for the pieces to get this to function as expected, but it did take a little trial and error. The next question to answer was, how would the camera work? Well, the answer is simple. It simply wouldn't rotate in an online match. In offline mode, because there are two local players sitting at the same computer, the camera rotates to allow each player to have the perspective of being at their own side of the board. This wouldn't make sense for an online match because each player now has their own screen to look at, so the camera has no reason to switch to the opposite side of the board after each turn. With these changes alone, I was able to play a match from start to finish and everything worked as intended. After the playtest, the next three questions were immediately obvious. What happens after a match? What happens if a player leaves during a match? And what happens if a player disconnects before a match starts? 
In its current state, when a match ends normally, players are sent all the way back to the main menu scene. I changed this to send players back to the lobby instead. The bigger issue to take care of was what happens if a player disconnects from a match before it ends. Right now, this breaks the game. If a player leaves, the game will attempt to continue as normal as if they're still there and will be stuck during your non-existing opponent's next turn because there's no one there to make a move. Fortunately, Fishnet has a callback function that triggers just before a player disconnects. When this happens, a message is sent to the server and then to the remaining player to let them know that their opponent has left the match. To communicate this visually, I took some inspiration from Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. When an opponent leaves the match, all their cards kind of pop away. So for Chess 2, all the pieces just vanish in this little poo particle effect and the remaining player is presented with a message to let them know that they won by forfeit. Another thing that had to be addressed was what happens if a player disconnects before a match starts? This was an important question to answer and also had a simple solution using something that was already in place. And that was the message that pops up when waiting for everyone to load into the game scene. I set the server to wait there for 60 seconds after the first player fully loads the scene. After 60 seconds, the game considers any player that has not fully loaded that scene as timed out and sends a message to the player that's still waiting to let them know that their opponent did not connect. From there, they go back to the lobby. The next thing to figure out was how to handle time. Normally, players would have separate timers that would tick down during their respective turns. If a player runs out of time during their turn, they lose. I went with this, but in addition to it, added an extra stipulation. In addition to each player having a maximum time of 15 minutes total, they also are limited to two minutes per turn. That two minutes is pulled from their maximum time pool of 15 minutes. The reasoning behind this is mainly just to keep the game moving. Finally, how to handle stalemates. In order to keep the game from going longer than it needs to, I coded matches to go into end game once both players are down to two pieces each. During end game, both players have five turns each to attempt to get a checkmate. If neither player is able to make a game winning move within those five turns, then the game ends in a stalemate. Now these things can be tweaked in a future update of the game depending on how they work or don't work, but we'll just have to see after it's played a bit more. At this point, the update itself was done. The next thing to do was to decide where the server would be hosted. I looked around a bit and decided to go with Vulture or Vulture. I'm not sure how it's been out. But anyway, I went with them because of how they handled pricing as they had some plans that could fit within my budget. To get the server up and running, I first had to set up the server on their end. And once that was all set up, to test this, I ran the game on two separate devices, both connected on two separate networks. They were able to connect, and I was able to play a couple matches. From here, everything was ready to go. And there you have it, Chess 2 now has online multiplayer. I definitely plan on trying to make more multiplayer games in the future now that I've kind of learned a little bit from this. Now, I need to address the elephant in the room. Servers aren't free, and I'm not made of money. So I set up a Patreon. There are four tiers and each one supports the channel with server costs, this project, and future projects. Access to experiments, prototypes, and demos will all be available to download, which due to keeping the server up and running, also includes the online version of Chess 2. Alright, so editing Keely here. I kind of wanted to further explain this a little bit. The online version of Chess 2 is going to cost a dollar over on Itch, and over on Patreon it'll be available for free at the lowest tier. In either case, whether it be Itch or Patreon, all future updates for Chess 2 will be available for free for those who purchase the online version. Just wanted to clear that up a little bit. All right, other Keely, you can take it from here. As for the future of Chess 2, when it all comes down to how things go over the next two months, as for the time being, I want to shift over to smaller projects, things that I can get done in one to two weeks, not necessarily full games like this one. And my goal is to try to get to a point where I can upload at least once every two weeks instead of you know a month and a half in between uploads and hopefully further down the line at least once per week and i'm hoping that the patreon will help get the channel to that point as for what's next well, i've been looking through some old projects to find something that'd be fun to revisit specifically checking out my old projects that were scrapped due to me pretty much biting off more than i can chew with that project and uh just being overwhelmed by it and i found something i tried to work on over a decade ago i tried to make my own Mega Man zero game using flash 
Now, if you're from my generation, you know how awesome Flash games were. So I went for it. And needless to say, I did not finish that project. So what I want to do is to go back and attempt to finish what I started over a decade ago with this Mega Man Zero remake and uh, do like a demo using Unity this time around instead of Flash and making use of everything I've learned about programming and game design. But I'll save that for another video. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. And as I said before, you can get the online version of Chess 2 over on my Patreon. The local multiplayer version will remain free to download over on itch. That link is also below. Subscribe to stay up to date on this and future projects. We are just about at 3K subs, which is crazy because just over a month ago, I was stuck at about 27 subs. So I really cannot express how grateful I am to you guys for the support you've shown over the last two months. Seriously, thank you all for the support. But that's it for me. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and maybe I'll see some of you online. Peace.